some customers because of their coffee orders. What you should know about that new lawsuit against Duncan later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight we are just getting some new details in on those U.S. service members killed in the Middle East. The first American military death since the Israel-Hamas war began. Sergeant William Rivers, Specialist Kennedy Sanders, Specialist Brianna Moffitt killed in an armed drone attack at a military base in Jordan. According to the U.S. military, more than 30 other people were hurt with new questions tonight about how this could have happened and how the U.S. will respond. You see him there. One new question. Might there have been some kind of a drone mix up? According to our Pentagon team, that's one theory being put out there by officials, that this enemy drone was not shot down because it was mistaken for an American drone coming back to base. Another theory, maybe this drone came in super low to the ground. We're learning it's the third drone attack on this base in just six months. The U.S. blames militants backed by Iran. Iran denies any involvement, but here's what is clear. There's going to be a response, as President Biden put it, with the National Security Council spokesperson telling NBC News the administration is, in his words, working through options for what comes next. We'll do that on our schedule, in our time, and we'll do it in a manner of the president's choosing as commander in chief. So what does that look like? What would that be, right? That's one of the big questions we have tonight. Second, how does this attack fit into this broader tit for tat between the U.S. and some of the rebel groups that we've been watching in the region? And then potentially complicating things even more, there's now the Houthis claiming responsibility for new missile attacks against a U.S. ship in the Red Sea. How does that fit in? With all of it, of course, happening in the tinderbox of the Middle East, on edge since the war in Gaza started nearly four months ago after that terror attack on Israel. Raf Sanchez is live for us in Tel Aviv tonight. Kelly O'Donnell is posted up at the White House, but I want to start with Courtney Kuby at the Pentagon, who's been leading our reporting here. Tell us what else we're learning tonight, Court, about these attacks and about some of these theories that you're hearing from some of your sources on how this could have happened. Yeah, Hallie, so as soon as we heard about this attack yesterday and the fact that it was a drone that was able to cause so many U.S. casualties, three U.S. soldiers tragically killed. We saw their pictures earlier. They were identified by the Pentagon earlier today, but at least 40 others injured, including some pretty serious injuries uh, that required medevacking out of the area. So the question has been, how was this drone able to get on this base, which does have air defense systems? And while it's still not 100 percent clear how that happened, a couple of the theories that the U.S. is looking at is that as you you mentioned possibly it was coming in at the same time a U.S. drone was coming in or landing at the base, and that may have confused those air defense systems. They're also looking at the possibility it just was flying at such a low altitude that the air defense systems may have, have either missed it or it was able to somehow evade them. But the other reason for the high number of casualties here, Hallie, is because of where the drone that was packed with explosives landed. It was right near a housing area where many U.S. troops were asleep at the time. So we didn't have a case where troops were able to go into a bunker and seek any kind of shelter. So as I mentioned, we had at least 40 U.S. troops injured in this attack, including traumatic brain injury um, and some who had to be medevac even all the way on um, onto launch tool for further treatment. But the question is, has the U.S. determined real attribution here? They are saying that this attack has all the attribu attributes and, and hallmarks of Kataib Hezbollah. That's an Iranian-backed militia group that operates in Iraq and Syria. They've been behind many of the uh, roughly 160 other attacks on U.S. bases in Iraq and Syria over the last three months. The U.S. isn't saying with certainty that they are directly behind it. What we are hearing, though, including from here at the Pentagon podium today, is that this attack, while maybe not directly directed by Iran, has the fingerprints of Iran on it, Hallie. You talk about, Court, these questions of attribution here. There are also questions now looking ahead of potential retaliation. How might the U.S. respond? What can we say about the range of options that the Pentagon is considering? What is on that spectrum? So when we think about how the U.S. has responded to previous attacks where U.S. service members have been injured in Iraq and Syria, they have gone after what they say is a proportional response. So maybe going after a, a warehouse that houses the drones or um, per, potentially a command and control area, something that they say is degrading these groups' ability to carry out future attacks. Why this may look a little different, Hallie, is because we will see something that's broader than that, that's bigger than that. U.S. officials don't want to talk about it specifically here. And I have to say, I don't know how close they are to making final determinations mm. on actual strikes. I think they're, I, I do believe that they're still working through these options. But we should expect something that looks different than the previous attacks. And also, you know, I mean, what we're hearing more and more is there's a growing belief and sense that these previous strikes 
on the Houthis, on these militia groups in Iraq and Syria, they simply are not working to deter in the way that they are meant to, Hallie. Courtney Kuby live for us there at the Pentagon. By the way, on Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin's first day back to work, of course, after his hospitalization. Court, uh, great reporting. Thank you for being with us. Kelly O, let me bring you in here with more from the White House, because you know President Biden now is facing pressure on multiple fronts. Talk us through the deliberations and the timeline for him. Well, there are different pipelines of information coming to the president, certainly from where Courtney is posted, the Pentagon preparing various options, the national security team convened today. The president's met with them twice to discuss the range of issues, not only the options presented to him by the military, but all of the other considerations, the political ramifications, trying to get the intel on what is known about these groups. So a core question, of course, has to be who is specifically responsible and what are the points of influence. And as you re referenced, if the previous strikes have not been effective, then looking at a broader perspective of what type of retaliation from the U.S. is proportional, appropriate, but would also be effective. So all of those considerations, and they are complex and difficult, and they reside with the president and his unique authority. At the same time, it comes in a political space where you will have lawmakers on Capitol Hill who are voicing their desire to see the U.S. Uh, show some kind of deterrence to Iran. There is frustration mm -hmm. over authority uh, and questions about can the president act on his own? The White House says yes, he can under the provisions of Article 2 of the Constitution to defend and protect U.S. service people. So it really comes down to a time when the president wants to act, an ability to articulate what is the aim of a mission that would be retaliatory, and can they answer the question of how likely is it to be effective? None of these are simple issues. They all carry potential weight, great risk. There could be political implications. That's right. All of that will play out for a timeline that we really don't have any sense of how fast this will happen. Hallie? Kelly O'Donnell, live for us there at the White House. Kelly, thank you. We've got a lot of breaking news from this region, including out of Israel, where we're just now learning about the framework of a deal that could free some Israeli and American hostages in exchange for a pause in fighting that lasts a couple of months. Just as NBC News is obtaining two security dossiers accusing a dozen U.N. aid workers of being terrorists, this document names 12 people some of whom allegedly took part in that October 7th terror attack by Hamas. These people worked for the UN Relief and Works Agency. You probably heard it described as UNRWA, which is active in providing aid to Gaza. Many of these people have now been fired. We should note the documents we have do not contain any evidence of these allegations, and NBC News has not independently verified Israel's claims. In a statement, the UNRWA head says they're launching an investigation and will hold anyone involved in acts of terror accountable. Raf Sanchez is following this and a number of other angles in Tel Aviv live for us tonight. Already you're seeing some of the allegations having an impact with countries pulling funding, which could be devastating for people in Gaza. The U.S., of course, among those countries, suspending funding for now. Talk us through it. Yeah, Hallie, and the U.S. is UNRWA's single biggest donor, some $300 million every year. It is hard to overstate what a big role UNRWA plays in Gaza. So during peacetime, around 70 percent of Gazans are Palestinian refugees. That means they themselves or they are the descendants of people who were displaced from their homes in 1948 in the first Arab-Israeli war. They are classed as refugees. That gives them access to UNRWA facilities like schools, like health care. They basically are a parallel social security system in Gaza in peacetime. In war, as we've been reporting extensively, Hallie, the health care system has basically collapsed. It is UNRWA that is providing a lot of the basic medical aid. It is UNRWA that is providing the shelters that displaced Palestinians are trying to find safety inside of. And UNRWA is saying that if the U.S., if these other countries continue to hold off on this aid, their ability to provide this really life-saving humanitarian support is going to collapse at the end of February. Take a listen to what un one UNRWA official had to say. What we have, the fund that we have, it will be enough for the end of February. But after that, we may suspend the whole operation of UNRWA. If there will be no renewing to the fund until the end of February, it is a catastrophe. Now, you heard John Kirby over at the White House a little bit earlier saying that this American pause is pending the outcome of the U.N.'s own internal investigation of these allegations. 
and they also want to see what kind of safeguards the U.N. puts in place afterwards. Ali. The other piece of news coming out of Israel today, of course, is this framework for some kind of a 60-day pause in fighting that would lead to the release of some hostages here, as reported by our Andrew Mitchell. This is something that people have been asking about ever since we saw the last set of hostages released. Andrew asked the Qatari prime minister about that framework today. Of course, the Qatari is very involved in these negotiations. I want to play that. I will describe it, uh, the progress uh, that we are achieve, that we are making uh, in the last couple of weeks is, is we are in much better place than where we were uh, a few weeks ago. So a better place, he says, than we were a few weeks ago. Kind of optimistic. The Israelis do not seem to share that optimism, uh, as we are also just hearing more from the region. Talk us through it. Yeah, Hallie, so Israel's war cabinet, the four-man committee that is basically running the war, is meeting as we speak here in Tel Aviv. They are discussing that proposal, which was hammered out by CIA Director Bill Burr and some of his counterparts in the Middle East in Paris over the weekend. But as we've talked about many times, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is the head of this unwieldy coalition government that includes cabinet ministers from the far right. And when Prime Minister Netanyahu, you can see on his screen, saying there are some conditions that are not acceptable to Israel in this proposal, one of the big ones is how long any ceasefire would last. Netanyahu is under real pressure from the far right of his government to keep these ceasefires as short as possible. Some of these far right ministers were unhappy with the last ceasefire, which only lasted a week. This proposal is for 60 days. The other difficult pill for the Israeli government to swallow is they're going to have to release a lot of Palestinian prisoners in exchange for these remaining Israeli hostages. And some of those, Halley, are likely to be people with serious convictions for terrorism, yeah. for murder. So we will see if that is something that Netanyahu can sell to his government. Ali. Raf, even in the last couple of minutes, as you and I have been having this conversation, we've heard now uh, from Hamas saying there will be no exchange of prisoners until Israeli forces end hostilities and withdraw. This has been consistent, of course, from what we had heard from Hamas previously. Um, I know, again, that this is all just coming in, but can you give us a sense here of what would have to um, change in some of these talks in order to figure out any glimmer of hope for some of these hostage families, uh, some of whom will be meeting with the National Security uh, Advisor, Jake Sullivan, here tomorrow? in Washington, as NBC News can report. Yeah, so as you said, Hamas's consistent position has been no hostages will be released until the war is ended. That is a position that they are reiterating tonight. Is there some wiggle room here, Hallie, where mm. we could go into a 60-day ceasefire, some hostages could be released, there could be a mechanism for the ceasefire to extend further, potentially extend permanently, possibly. At this moment... We don't have a formal rejection from Hamas of this proposal, but as you say, that initial statement is not encouraging sounding. Raf Sanchez live for us in Tel Aviv watching all of it. Raf, thank you. We've got some more breaking news from here at home tonight with federal prosecutors telling our team the FBI has arrested somebody who's threatened to bomb a synagogue in Massachusetts, bringing up, in his words, apparently genocide. The suspect. In court today on a single federal charge, he was arrested Thursday. He's been in custody ever since and faces up to a decade in prison if convicted. Tom Winter is joining us now. So, Tom, the FBI says that this suspect invoked genocide in his threat, right? Why? That's exactly right, Hallie. And as a matter of fact, that court hearing has wrapped up. And that individual identified as John Reardon. He's 59 years old from Massachusetts, will be detained, and he has been in police custody since last Thursday, as you mentioned, uh, pending a uh, detention hearing. Uh, they've charged him uh, with a single count. Basically, if you make a threat using the phone, that's in violation of federal law, specifically threatening to bomb a synagogue that's located in Attleboro, Massachusetts, about 40 miles south-southwest of Boston. Uh, he made specific threats and said that his uh, mood or his feeling about uh, Israel changed following their response to Hamas's terror attack, uh, threatened, as I said, to bomb uh, that synagogue. And uh, federal officials in Boston have taken these types of threats quite seriously, and they've talked about about how they've been on the increase, Hallie. So uh, just another case and another threat against the Jewish community. Tom Winter, thank you very much. Even more breaking news into us now. This from South Carolina, where a judge has just denied Alec Murdoch a new trial. This is something that we had been watching in uh, a hearing that had been going on. You are taking a live look now at court, where the judge has just said now that Murdoch will not get that new trial. After some allegations by Murdoch's attorneys of 
impropriety, essentially, by the court clerk. This is after a bombshell acknowledgement today from one of the jurors in Murdoch's initial trial, saying, essentially, that she was influenced by that court clerk in finding Murdoch guilty, of course, that trial, the verdict, sending Murdoch to prison for life in the murders of his wife and son. Listen to this. To me, it felt like she made it seem like he was already guilty. Did that affect your finding of guilty in this case? Yes, ma'am. Obviously, the court has ordered that the jurors' names and faces be kept secret. That's why I didn't hear that juror as she was speaking. But here's the reason why her acknowledgement is so significant. Because, again, Murdoch's attorneys had said the clerk tampered with the jury. They say she was saying things like, watch him closely, watch his actions. She is denying doing anything inappropriate. Listen. I usually give a little pep talk to the jurors. Um, it's, it's sometimes hard sitting a long time, but my usual, and I do remember saying, pay attention, it's a big day today. It was not for one side or the other. I want to bring in now our Kathy Park, who is covering this from South Carolina, as well as our NBC News legal expert, Angela Sanadella. Okay, so Kathy, the question had been, would this acknowledgement by the juror that the court clerk, she says, influenced her decision making, would it be enough to get Murdoch a new trial? It turns out in the last five minutes, the answer from this judge is no. Explain it. Yeah, absolutely, Hallie. So certainly a long day in court today um, got underway just before 10 o'clock this morning. And we are told that court has adjourned after a denial for a new trial for Alec Murdoch. But as you mentioned earlier, there were a total of 11 jurors who were brought into the courtroom today. And the judge was very explicit in her questioning. She wanted to know if Becky Hill, the court of clerk, had any sort of communication with the juror. And if so, uh, did they sway? Uh, the juror's decision in coming down with a guilty verdict. But the, the twist going into this, we kind of knew this, was juror 630. And that goes back to the affidavit that was filed fall of last year, which essentially prompted or helped prompt this retrial, this evidentiary hearing. But in that affidavit, jury 630, uh, juror 630 said, look, um, Becky Hill told members of the jury to look closely at Murdoch um, and, and at, said other comments along those lines and questioned um, his credibility before he took the stand and therefore his defense team his lawyers argued that Becky Hill was accused of jury tampering and of course the judge said uh, no it didn't raise to that bar and you know going back to that juror which was in question from the start this morning um, we were going and kind of comparing notes it contradicted what she initially said from that affidavit and what she said under oath today in court you played it out she said that she was swayed by Becky Hill but when you go back to the affidavit it it didn't match up. She said she was pressured to vote guilty because of members of the jury. Um, also, we heard from Becky Hill earlier this afternoon. She took the stand and she was questioned by both sides. She was cross examined and uh, the defense. They were really grilling her about her motivation. They said, you know, she was seeking fame and money. She had a book that was published, so she was going after that. And if she uh, wanted uh, a, a guilty verdict and not necessarily a mistrial to help with book sales. So those were, those were some of the highlights from court today. But ultimately, once again, Hallie, the judge denied um, the motion for a new trial, which uh, means the appeals process uh, will now move forward because everything was kind of on pause because the conviction was uh, trying to be, uh, you know, they wanted to move forward with an appeal, but it looks like now that this has adjourned, um, now the appeals process for that conviction, yeah. that double conviction can now uh, push ahead. Kathy, I want you to stand by for one second. Angela, our NBC News legal analyst, I want to bring you in here because as we're looking through some of the notes here from the judge in court today, she was not particularly complimentary of the court clerk, right? I mean, she says that she found her not completely credible, influenced by what she described as the siren call of celebrity. But ultimately, this judge decided that she doesn't think that a new trial is warranted because of what she describes as some fleeting and foolish comments by a publicity-seeking clerk of court. Again, not complimentary to this court clerk, Clerk, but ultimately not enough to get Alec Murdoch a new trial here. How do you see it? 
Look, this judge was incredibly thorough today. Nobody listening to the hearing could claim that she just glossed over this decision-making process. She really spent minutes grilling all parties here. And in fact, when she started grilling Becky Hill on areas that she had previously said would not even be allowed to be admissible evidence in this evidentiary hearing, I really thought there was a chance she was going to grant a new trial. But it all comes down to the burden of proof. At this point, the burden of proof that she established before this trial was pretty high. It's not just any improper conduct. It's improper conduct that would have prejudiced a juror into making a different decision. And when we did see Juror Z up there, her testimony was pretty convincing, but she never explicitly said that Becky Hill's statements moved the needle fully for her. In fact, I believe she said it was the other jurors finally in that deliberation that influenced her instead of herself. So I think that is what this hinges on. Mm. What was the final needle? Hallie. Listen, is it help us understand this because the court clerk, you know, she talks to the jury, right? I mean, that is something that happens. She described laying out some instructions here. That's not atypical for a court clerk to do, right? That's part of their job. The question is whether this particular clerk went above and beyond in implying that she believed Murdoch was guilty, right? Yeah, that's exactly it. And in fact, they had another court clerk testifying today who said that what Becky Hill did was really outside of the norm. And there was even an allegation that she drove a juror home someday and that this court clerk who was there to help out Becky Hill really told her that is outside the bounds of what we are supposed to do. So what Becky Hill did was clearly out of bounds. And that is also something the judge mentioned. She was not a fan of Becky Hill. But she said that this behavior didn't rise to the level of influencing a juror. And so I think what she means is that the outcome of this trial likely wouldn't have changed had Becky Hill not been there. So ultimately, it comes down to common sense. Kathy, let me go back to you here because we referenced it, I think, in the introduction to this segment as we're getting this developing news. Again, this decision by the judge coming in literally within the last eight minutes here. You're watching it all now live on NBC News Now right here. But, Kathy, one of the things we talked about was the, was how the initial Murdoch trial was, was called by some the double murder trial of the century in South Carolina because of how high profile it was, how much of a member of the community Murdoch had been, how everybody in this area seemed to know Murdoch, have some connection via six degrees of separation to the Murdoch family here. Give us a sense today with this obviously significant now ruling from the judge and this very long hearing, what it was like in the room, what it was like outside court, how much people where you are, are paying attention to this. Um, so we had our Sam Brocker colleague in the courtroom. Um, so we were monitoring everything, obviously, from court TV, which was a pool camera today. But I should note, Hallie, that uh, the jurors, they remained anonymous because the judge was stressed the fact that she wanted to protect the integrity of their anonymity. So we didn't see any of the jurors' faces. We don't know um, their names. So all of that was concealed. We just heard the audio. So the judge moved fairly quickly. Um, I would say probably spent no more than five to ten minutes aside from juror z who kind of gave that uh, conflicting information um right out the gate from uh, of this preliminary hearing but it, it moved very quickly um and then by lunchtime there was a break and then becky hill was on the stand there were um some other curveballs in the day today because there was a point when the bailiff whispered in the judge's ear and said look um the jury they have access to their cell phones and apparently they were looking at court tv the feed and saw the testimony from the first jurors so obviously mm. uh the the judge put a squash on that and and had the bailiff supervise the jury room um from then on but there were a lot of twists and turns today um right from the beginning yeah. of with juror z uh, the issue with the cell phone but outside of the courtroom where I, where I spent most of the day today obviously a lot of media attention but as far as the community though it, it seems like this is something that they kind of put in their past but obviously this is still garnering a lot of national attention Kathy, stand by for just one second because Murdoch's attorneys are speaking now outside court. I want to listen in for just a beat to see if they're giving us any insight into their next steps here. Let's listen for just a second. She had a profit motive for doing what she did. And guess what? Justice Toll ruled that was exactly the case today. So we feel vindicated on the facts. The law is unsettled. And, and, and early on, she acknowledged, and we all acknowledge, this was not going to be the final say-so on the law. That's going to be determined by the appellate courts, and that's the next step. If we had lost today, I mean, we did lose today. If we'd won today, the state would be appealing. And so no matter who, who wins today, it's just one step in the process. We would not have a trial next week or next month. It would all 
be wrapped up and gone up to the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court. And so, so we're prepared for that. But the good news so is. So you have been listening to Alec Murdoch's attorneys there, obviously indicating this fight is not That's over. Good. And Angela Sanadella, this alludes to what you were talking about earlier. An appeals process will move forward now. Talk us through what that looks like and the potential timeline there. So they can actually appeal the results of this hearing, and they have two levels, as he mentioned. There's the appellate court, and then on top of that, there is the Supreme Court. Now, I don't necessarily think that appealing this hearing will have a lot of fortune for them, given that the judge who ruled over this is significant and very experienced, and she was very careful today. And that judge, she was a former chief justice of the Supreme Court. She has an extraordinary amount of appellate experience, but this appeal as he said, could move forward on either side. So this is not the end of the road here for Murdoch. I imagine uh, Angela Senadella, Kathy Park, it means that the three of us will be speaking again at some point uh, in the future from South Carolina as this Murdoch case, of course, continues these twists and turns as Alec Murdoch, again, has now been sentenced to life in prison for the murders of his wife and son. Kathy, Angie, thank you both. Let's take it down to the border now with new developments in the escalating border beef between Texas and the Biden administration. Look at this. These are federal officers here entering the river that separates Texas from Mexico. That's their boat that's about to pull off into the water there. It's the first time we've seen something like this in weeks. Why? Because Texas state officials had been blocking the border patrol, the feds, from accessing most of that huge park right along the border where thousands of migrants try to cross into the U.S. Partly, they put up more razor wire. The whole thing had to go to the Supreme Court just recently. It comes as we're learning about a record-setting nearly 250,000 encounters with migrants at the southern border just in the month of December. And as always, there's a nexus back home here to Washington. A key negotiator in the Senate tonight says they're ready to vote on a bipartisan border deal this week. But Republicans in the House, the other chamber, say that bill is DOA. NBC's Guad Venegas is live for us in the border town of Eagle Pass, Texas, the center of this fight over razor wire, Guad, that we're seeing federal agents finally getting access to this key section of the river. What does it mean now with this long-running feud that we've covered between the Republican Texas governor and, of course, the Democratic president of the United States? Hallie, so many things happen in here simultaneously. So you mentioned the razor wire and the concertino wire that have been installed here. The Supreme Court ruling that Border Patrol can cut it or move it if they choose to do so. Even after that announcement, uh, Texas state authorities set up even more of that wire, some of it uh, right behind me. And then now we see these boats coming into the water. Now, this is the first time that we get access to this boat ramp. We had heard uh, in the past DHS saying they did not get access to this ramp when they needed to use it. But Texas the state authorities have said that they have always given access to the boat ramp for Border Patrol to come in with their boats. So it's difficult to say, but today we were here and we did see Border Patrol use that ramp uh, to get some of those boats in the water. Now, we also now have heard from 26 state attorneys from different states who have signed a letter supporting uh, Texas and Governor Greg Abbott in all of their efforts to enforce immigration law here at the Texas border with Mexico, uh, that support coming from then, while Greg Abbott is also also informing that they have now sent over 100,000 migrants from Texas to sanctuary cities around the country. This is part of that Lone Star uh, operation. Now, when it comes to the crossings, Ali, it's important also to note that we don't have the surge that we had back in December. I was here in December. We were seeing groups of hundreds, thousands arriving per day. Uh, and today we've seen two groups arrive, less than 10 migrants, uh, some of them having to get rescued uh, by state authorities here just behind us. In fact, one of those uh, rescues. We saw an adult come with a toddler. Uh, we were here when uh, they pulled the toddler out of the water. A medical team of first responders had to attend to that toddler. Then they uh, uh, took him into an ambulance. At one point, the mother joined uh, the toddler. And the other adults with the group uh, were turned over to the custody of state troopers. We know that for the last few weeks, uh, state troopers have been arresting migrants here and charging them with criminal trespassing, Hallie. Guad Venegas, live for us there along the border in Eagle Pass, as we can see, obviously, the activity just behind you. Guad Venegas, thank you so much for that. We've got a lot more coming up here on the show, including, check this out, hundreds of farmers in France putting Paris, in their words, under siege. Why they have tractors circling the city. Plus, the lengths one woman in California went to to try to save her stolen dog. Did you see that? Wow. So check this out, farmers hitting not the fields, but the streets in France 
not in cars, but tractors, obviously, hundreds of them here, lining up on a big highway that leads to Paris, blocking traffic, shutting down long stretches of the road. Just one part of a bigger protest. Look at this. They had piled up tires and burned them. They also dumped a bunch of manure and dead animals in front of the gates of government offices. Why are these farmers doing this? Well, they're hoping to pressure the French government to give them things like more pay, better protection against cheap imports. They feel like the future of their industry is at stake. Josh Letterman is joining us now. Listen, Paris has seen a lot of protests this week. We all know the soup at the Mona Lisa incident from uh, environmental protesters over the weekend. This new French prime minister has also only been in the job for about a month. So what's the government saying about all this? Well, the government, first of all, Holly, is making clear that they have a red line, which is they are not going to tolerate these uh, French protesters shutting down airports, shutting mm. down the largest agricultural market in Paris, which feeds about 8 million people. But they are trying to take some steps to appease these farmers. They announced measures including uh, freezing a tax on the diesel that they use for tractors, which was really very loathed by those farmers. They're making some changes uh, to cut red tape on environmental regulations. But the farmers are saying, look, this is small potatoes. This is not enough to actually address the structural problems here, which is that uh, they feel that they are not able to sell their products for enough. They feel like there are goods flowing in from elsewhere in Europe at lower prices and lower quality that's driving down their prices. And they say, frankly, this is not going to be a sustainable uh, field of work for the next generation unless something changes ASAP. Connect the dots for us of how this plays into the bigger food crisis around the world that we're seeing that's only been made worse by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Because as you talk about sort of the agricultural issues in France, that's part of the driver. Yeah, there's sort of two elements to this. I just spoke with a French family farmer from the Normandy region who said, look, before the war, we used to sell a whole lot of wine to Russia. Since uh, the war started, they're not allowed to sell products to Russia anymore. There's that embargo. And as a result, they've lost a large part of their market. But they also say that when the war started uh, and the Russians, of course, blockaded the Black Sea, wouldn't let the Ukrainians export their products uh, by sea, the EU tried to help Ukraine out by saying, OK, look, we're going to remove a lot of the barriers to importing food from Ukraine into the EU. So at least you can sell your product and hold your economy together. The French farmers say that a flow of Ukrainian uh, hay, uh, grain and hay and other products is coming in at lower prices than what the French sell their own products for is driving the market uh, to a low and making it impossible for French farmers to compete. So even though they have sympathy for the Ukrainians, they say their own farmers and their own families are suffering as a result of what the EU has tried to do to help Ukraine over the, these last couple of years, Hallie. Josh Letterman, live for us there overseas. Thank you. Let's get you over to the five things, our theme, team things you should know about tonight. Number one, police in Philly catching that teenage murder suspect after he spent five days on the run. They found him getting on a bus in the city. Remember, this teen had been getting transported to a hospital for an injury to his hand when he escaped last week. He's waiting to go on trial for a 2020 murder charge. Number two, to L.A. now, where police are looking for a group of alleged dog nappers after they drove off with a French bulldog. Look at that Frenchie. Cell phone video, look at this, shows the owner clinging to the car. She jumps on the hood. She's clinging to the car. She's thrown off, ultimately. Police show up a few minutes later. The woman is okay, but her pup, Onyx, still has not been found. Police say there have been a number of high-profile crimes targeting Frenchies in this area of L.A. Number three, the ex-IRS contractor who pleaded guilty to leaking the tax returns of former President Donald Trump, among others, sentenced today to five years in prison. He also, remember, leaked the tax info of some of the country's wealthiest people, like Jeff Bezos. The judge gave him the maximum sentence, calling the crime an attack on our constitutional democracy. Number four, the FBI says uh, an English painting that made history has been returned to its owner after it was stolen more than 50 years ago. The painting, called The School Mistress, was taken by mobsters from the owner's Jersey home back in 1969. The feds think gangs held onto the painting up until a few years ago when an accounting firm found it at a property in Utah. Number five, Suits is now the most streamed show in a single year. <laughs> People love it, man. People are obsessed with Suits. Nearly 60 billion viewing minutes in 2023. The former champion used to be The Office, which hit 57.1 billion minutes in 2020. But Meghan Markle and the Suits folks, they take the, take the crown, if you will. When we come back, a missing woman in Lake Tahoe found stuck on a gondola. Why nobody heard her screams for help for so long.
So tonight, as the Republican presidential field looks ahead to the next votes in Nevada and South Carolina, we are looking at how former President Donald Trump got those big double-digit wins in the first two states, Iowa and New Hampshire, how he pulled that support together. Our NBC News campaign reporter Alex Tabbitt has talked with hundreds of voters in both states over the last many months, from rallies to town halls to, yes, local diners. And tonight, he's leading our backstory, that behind-the-scenes look at how a story comes together, our version of the reporter's notebook, or in this case, the Embed's journal. He changes everything. He needs to get back in. He gets stuff done. He's about America. He puts America first. He gets the job done. we got to be united, and that's what Trump wants. He wants a united America. Hundreds of conversations with Trump supporters across Iowa and New Hampshire over seven months. And what have I learned? The people who love him really love him. Donald Trump is great. He, he picks on a lot of people. He get over it. And through all those interviews, I kept hearing a lot of the same things over and over. Trump fans are laser focused on the economy, immigration policy, and feel an overwhelming sense of injustice. Like Nicholas Dagnall, an 18 year old high school senior from Franklin, New Hampshire. He's a businessman, and at the end of the day, America is a business and should be run like a business. Despite low unemployment, below 4% for almost two years, Americans are still feeling the impact of inflation. I first met Virgil Thornston, a Navy veteran at a barber shop in Wacon, Iowa, in August of 2023. The 3.7% inflation rate at the time, way down from its peak, he said wasn't being reflected in his day-to-day -day experience. Things still cost a lot more. Well, one thing is I was just over and had a meatball dinner and it cost me 16 bucks. And even five months later, on the night of the Iowa caucuses, brothers Mike and Joe Stein, student athletes at the University of Iowa, agreed that higher prices were a big part of Trump's win. I think people, people know that they had a better lifestyle with inflation and uh, grocery money and, the results and gas money. Themselves. The results speak for themselves. And then there's the border. Trump's signature issue starting all the way back in 2015, still resonating. From the Lothenburg brothers in Dubuque, Iowa in September. Our border is just too easy to get into. To Keith Christine, who I met waiting in line for a Trump rally during a thunderstorm in July. The border and everything, all the crises have just doubled and everything was better under the Trump administration. New Hampshire and Iowa, both a long way from the southern border and the cities where migrants are getting bust. But it doesn't mean that the record number of people arriving aren't on voters' minds. The invasion at our border has brought a number of, of enemies of America in, and our infrastructure is not well guarded. And finally, I kept hearing over and over that Trump is the victim. I feel like he's fighting for his right. 91 felony counts, but Colleen Decker, a pastor's wife in Ottumwa, Iowa, says they've only helped the former president. I definitely think it has um, promoted him. Trump's polling has only gotten stronger in the face of his indictments. Bring on some more charges. The guy died of ham sandwich. When I asked Trump supporters at the Iowa State Fair back in August why Trump had been indicted for the fourth time in Georgia for his alleged efforts to illegally overturn the election. Voters like Jeff Lendrick, a school custodian, said they didn't know why and they didn't care. Do you care that he's been indicted four times? No, that just makes me want to vote for him more. Because whoever the Democrats hate is who I like. Trump's legal troubles aren't the only so-called injustice I kept hearing about. Many of them believe Trump's baseless assertion that the last election was stolen from him. I think they cheated before, and I think they're going to try to do it again because they're a bunch of communists that don't care. George Crosby, a retired truck driver and veteran from Fitzwilliam, New Hampshire, is just one of the many people who repeated Trump's unfounded claim that he actually won re-election in 2020. President Trump, he is still president in my mind. A man whose personality has seemingly overshadowed the rest of the Republican field. A man who loves this country like I love my country. And whose supporters are completely enamored. When you see him hugging a flag and kissing it, it's real. It's true. Alex is joining us now. So, Alex, we know that many of the former president's supporters inside the Republican Party, as you point out, very loyal to him. The question is, what happens to former President Trump if he does make it into a general election against President Biden? Of course, that's where some of these question marks are. One of the things that I found uh, in my time in the field, and it was great to see you the last couple of weeks in Iowa, New Hampshire, is that when you talk to supporters of these candidates, any of the candidates, they want to tell you why they're backing who they back. Did you find that to be your experience as you were living in Iowa, as you're getting ready to move to Arizona to cover that state? 
Not necessarily is that always the case for me, Hallie. Uh, former President Donald Trump's rhetoric against the media industry, against journalism, has taken a bit of a toll in terms of when I'm trying to interview voters. But when there is that hesitancy, at least my approach is I take the camera, I put it off on the side. I talk to these voters and I, I tell them, I work for NBC News, but I tell them a bit about who I am as a person. And I learn a little bit about who they are, because I'm not going to be able to dispel anyone's preconceived notion about the media industry in a couple of minutes, but I can build a little bit of trust. And if they do do the interview, and it doesn't always work out, but when they do take the interview, I, I find it makes a more authentic interview, a more authentic experience. On the back end, I'll take down their phone number, I'll give them a call, I'll shoot them a text, and show them that their interview was properly reflected and their opinion was properly displayed. Hallie? Alex Tabbitt, uh, thank you very much for bringing us uh, a look there at what is driving some of the support for former President Trump. It's part of a story, as we'll be doing in the backstory, our reporter's notebook throughout the next few weeks leading up to South Carolina. Thanks. We've got some breaking news coming into us in just the last couple of minutes, too, related to the Justice Department. Attorney General Merrick Garland set to have back surgery on Saturday, which means his duties are going to go to the deputy attorney general for what officials call a short time. Now, typically, this wouldn't necessarily be national news, right? But it is coming on the heels of, you, of course, remember what happened with Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, who was far less transparent when he ended up in the hospital for surgery after being diagnosed with prostate cancer. It took days for the White House to find out about that. As for Attorney General Garland, he is expected to come back to work in early February. NBC News covers hundreds of other stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what the TELUS is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Southern Bureau, police in Florida reuniting a missing 11-year-old girl with her family thanks to a canine unit. Look at this, new body cam video. Shows Mary Lou, that's the police dog, finding the girl locked in a bathroom at a local park. Deputies managed to talk the girl out of the bathroom, helped her get out, Canine greeted her with a big, big puppy kiss right there. Out of our Western Bureau, a ski resort in Tahoe is investigating after a woman was trapped in a gondola for 15 hours. She'd been in there going down the mountain when it stopped about halfway. She says she didn't have a phone. She tried screaming for help, but nobody heard her. It was the middle of the night. It wasn't until the next morning when the lift started back up that staff found her. Very scary experience for her. And at our Midwest Bureau, Traveling Circus says it's lucky to still have its animals after the semi-truck carrying them caught fire in Indiana. When officials responded, they found, look at this, five zebras, four camels, and one miniature horse. They put out the flames, they rescued all the animals, even stopped for a couple of pictures, too. Coming up here on the show, the legal case over milk money. We're talking about a class action lawsuit against Dunkin' and what it might mean for coffee shops everywhere. So tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight it's some potential legal trouble brewing for Duncan in a new lawsuit that asks an interesting question. Is charging for non-dairy milk discrimination against people who have problems drinking regular milk? The customers behind this new suit say yes, because they say being lactose intolerant or allergic to dairy milk, that's a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Here's our Vicky Wynn. Laura Primo is originally from New England, so naturally she was a Duncan regular. But recently, I can't touch any dairy with a 10 foot pole. She loves her coffee with coconut milk now, but when she realized Duncan was charging extra for it, she felt milked for money. It just kind of upset me. You know, my favorite coffee is, is messing with me. That's why she and nine other Duncan customers filed a class action lawsuit against the company last month, asking for at least five million in damages. The suit comes after a slew of other food class actions, those focused on misleading advertising against companies like Hershey and Kraft. Some have called those lawsuits frivolous and they've seen limited success in court. But this suit says Duncan is discriminating against people with lactose intolerance or milk allergies, alleging violations of the Americans with Disabilities Act. They're making a significant profit off of these customers, their customers, uh, because of uh, their disabilities. Because of the law, public entities have to make reasonable modifications for people with disabilities. At first glance, lactose intolerance or milk allergies may not seem like a disability, but in 2008, Congress broadened the law, which one expert thinks now covers those types of conditions. People who have chronic conditions, lactose intolerance, 
and food allergies. If they are substantially limiting their ability to eat and to function day to day, then they're considered disabilities under the act. Companies do have a way out. If they can prove making those changes would fundamentally alter the nature of their business or impose an undue burden. Duncan acknowledged the suit and has until March to respond. It did not reply to our request for comment. They offer sweeteners that aren't sugar. They offer decaffeinated coffee, not only caffeine coffee. It's to single out the non dear alternative is discriminatory. The same law firm behind the Duncan lawsuit also filed a separate but similar class action suit against Starbucks in 2022. Starbucks filed a motion to dismiss that is still pending. Starbucks arguing that the lawsuit moving forward would have far reaching consequences and would force retailers to choose between no longer offering more expensive items, losing substantial revenue or raising prices across the board. Vicky is joining us now. It's super interesting to hear about all these pieces of it, Vicky. And you mentioned there's been a whole bunch of food related lawsuits that have happened recently that have had limited success. Obviously, this is different, but help us understand the bigger picture here of customers, of consumers sort of standing up and trying to come after some companies for the way that they sell their products. Here, listen, Hallie, let's refresh your viewers' memories about a couple of the lawsuits. A woman in Florida sued Kraft, the maker of the Kraft macaroni and cheese, saying that it was misleading advertising, that it takes a lot longer than the three and a half minutes that's labeled on the cup to make that instant mac and cheese, that you they didn't account for the time to take the lid off or to pour the water in or to stir in the cheese sauce. That lawsuit tossed. The Hershey's lawsuit. You remember this one? It was filed at the end of mm -hmm. last year. A woman said, you know, those little jack-o'-lanterns and the footballs and the bats? Well, on the picture, they're advertised as having cute little faces, but you open that thing and the football, the football looks like an egg. There is no jack-o'-lantern face. <laughs> that is still making its way through the courts. This lawsuit is different. We're talking about the Americans with Disabilities Act, That's which right was put into place to be enforced via a lawsuit. There is no mechanism to enforce the ADA other than people suing. And so the hope here is that by saying that folks who have lactose intolerance, a real medical condition, right? If you can change the laws for these folks under the ADA, then hopefully it has broader implications for everyone. So these lawsuits are a little bit different than the others we've seen. Important point. Uh, Vicki, thank you very much. Keep following this one for us. We'll be interested to see how it turns out. Thanks. Still to come here on the show, why a Russian skating star's suspension could means America gets gold instead of silver for an Olympics that happened years ago. Plus, some new questions about any real change around doping and ice skating. That's coming up. All right, so can the U.S. get a silver medal upgraded to gold two years after the last Winter Olympics? Top officials here say, yeah, they should. After a Russian teenage ice skating superstar got hit with a four-year suspension. Do you remember this? This was the scandal of the Beijing Games. Kamila Valieva, who was then just 15 years old. Again, total superstar, world record holder. And apparently, somebody let down by the adults around her, with the world learning just hours before she took the ice that she had failed a drug test. This suspension now, four years, again, it's going to wipe out her performance in those games, although she is going to be allowed to compete in Italy in 2026, the next Winter Olympics. The U.S. anti-doping agency blames Russia, saying that this is yet another example of Moscow robbing clean athletes. Megan Fitzgerald has it all covered for us from London. Listen, nothing's going to get that moment back, right, where the U.S. figure skating team could have won it all but instead got second. Is there a possibility that the U.S. could actually end up with the gold here? When could that happen? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Team USA will never get that moment back. I mean, there wasn't even a, a medal ceremony, if you remember. Uh, this entire thing is unprecedented. We've never not seen a medal ceremony at the Olympic Games. But to your question, could Team USA get the gold? That is a question we will likely learn the answer to in March when the International Olympic Committee, and I'll pause for a second, is a ambulance going by, but when the International Olympic Committee meets in March, that's when we could learn whether or not Team USA is going to get the gold. But then you've got Japan that finished third. You've got Canada that finished fourth. So will Canada medal? Again, answers that could come in the next couple of weeks. But you also have to remember there's the possibility that that gold medal position could just remain vacant. That is something that we typically see when athletes uh, test positive for banned substances, Hallie.
As we're watching Valieva here, I mean, she was, again, just a total prodigy at the last Olympics. She's going to compete in the next one, but there were so many questions when this happened, and we covered it, I think, on the show, about the adults around her. It's not like Russia's state-sponsored drug program has been a secret. There was, like, an Oscar-winning documentary about it. But Valieva's coach, her doctor, so far they have not faced any repercussions, and the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency is also blaming the world agency that's supposed to stop cheating. They want a full review to stop this from ever happening again, Megan. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is not Russia's first rodeo, as you mentioned. We see this time and time and time again, and people are wondering uh, when will there be consequences so severe that this pattern stops. I mean, you look at 2018, for example, and we saw Russian athletes competing in the Olympics, albeit underneath the Olympic flag. Um, but that's on the heels of, of when the world found out about the 2014 doping scandal. Then fast forward to uh, the Olympics this year in um, Paris in 2024. And we are again going to see Russian athletes competing. Now, they will be competing under a, a different name. They'll be competing under individual neutral athletes. That, of course, is because the IOC made that determination after Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, but again, we will be seeing Russians competing in the Olympics fresh off of another scandal uh, that we just saw two years ago, Howie. Megan Fitzgerald live for us there overseas just a few months now ahead of Paris kicking off for, of course, the Summer Olympics. Megan, thank you so much. That does it for us for this hour. We've got a lot more coverage picking up right now. are coming on the air with new details, new questions, and new pressure after that attack that killed three U.S. troops in Jordan. We now know their names and a couple of leading theories on how this could have happened in the first place. Was it a drone mix-up? Here's what we don't know. What does a U.S. response look like, and what does it mean for a region on edge? We've got team coverage from the Pentagon to Israel, but we're just now getting new details about the framework for a deal that could free dozens of hostages and maybe stop the fighting in Gaza for two months. More on that and the new allegations against a U.N. aid group. Then we'll take you live to South Carolina, where a judge is denying a new trial for Alec Murdoch in just the last hour, even though one of the jurors who helped put him in prison for life for murder says the court clerk influenced her decision. So what comes next in a case that has captivated the country? Plus, the new fight over immigration with Texas state troopers getting in the way of Border Patrol agents along the river that separates Texas from Mexico, how it fits into the latest border battles here in Washington, and one of hip-hop's most infamous crimes finally going to trial. We'll take you inside court for what prosecutors are saying about the mysterious murder of a run DMC star a little later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we are starting tonight with some breaking news just into us now. A judge just denying Alec Murdoch's attempt to try to get a new trial after his defense team alleged jury tampering, essentially. They said that the court clerk in his original trial made comments to jurors that influenced them to find him guilty of killing his wife and son. Listen to this. One juror did testify today the court clerk influenced her verdict through some of the comments that she made, she said things like, watch him closely, watch his actions, etc." Here's that juror. It felt like she made it seem like he was already guilty. Did that affect your finding of guilty in this case? Yes, ma'am. Okay, a bombshell acknowledgement from that juror, as Sam Brock has been covering it all. He was inside court there in South Carolina. But Sam, the question had been, that juror said she acknowledged that the court clerk in this instance influenced her decision-making process as it related to the Murdoch trial. Of course, life behind bars for murdering his wife and son. That's what the jury found. But a judge now, late tonight, is coming out and saying, no, no, she's not saying complimentary things about the court clerk, but the judge also does not believe that there was jury tampering to the degree that it should mean a retrial. Talk us through what we're learning and where this goes. Yeah, exactly. So there's two pieces, two components to all this, Hallie, for there to be a retrial declared. One of them was, in fact, that Becky Hill made overtures that were inappropriate about material aspects of this case, which she did according to the judge's finding. But the second part about that was prejudicial. Were there any jurors that concluded that because of what she did in terms of telling them about watching his actions and they're trying to fool you, especially before the defense even brought his case, which is what one alternate said today, they have to actually take that and make it actionable 
we'll have that be a formidable part of why they chose to convict Alec Murdoch. What the judge concluded was there's no evidence of that. Now, I do want to go big picture for a second. There are 12 jurors total, right? 11 out of the 12 got onto the stand today and said, 10 of them, by the way, said that they didn't hear anything from Hill. But 11 out of 12 said that they were not influenced by what she said. One did say she was influenced, but her own testimony was conflicting with an affidavit that she submitted on months earlier where she said that the other jurors pressured her but made no mention of Hill whatsoever. So you got 11 out of 12 saying, no, I wasn't influenced by this. And the one who said that she was, there's a lot of questions there. So the judge took all this away in its totality and decided no retrial. But there is no question that siren call for celebrity. She thought that Becky Hill was out for potentially trying to sell her books, potential publicity in this case. Take a listen to this exchange with Dick Harputley in, uh, one of the attorneys for Murdoch, and specifically that issue of trying to sell her book. This whole scheme was about selling books. This Isn't it financially beneficial to you at the time to get more of these photographs out, more publicity, more Netflix, more HBOs, more Japanese? Doesn't that sell books for you? Didn't you see a financial advantage? Not at all. She said not at all, but Becky Hill's friend, who was called to testify and was also a clerk of court, her name is Rhonda, testified to the fact there were conversations with Becky months before Hallie, the trial even started, where Becky said, I want a lake house, you want to retire, mm. we need a guilty verdict to sell more books. That was a damning statement. Here's what the judge had to say about all of it as she was announcing her decision here not to allow a retrial in the Murdoch case. Let me play it. Ms. Hill was attracted by the siren call of celebrity. I simply do not believe that the authority of our South Carolina Supreme Court requires a new trial in a very lengthy trial such as this on the strength of some fleeting and foolish comments by a publicity influenced clerk of court. I mean, that's the, the core of it right there, Sam. So as we look ahead to next steps, Murdoch's attorneys have been pretty clear, and we showed it as breaking news in our last hour here on NBC News Now as this, developing, if this is developing. They're pretty clear that the appellate court, right, the, the appeals process is where this goes next, and it would have been where this goes next, win or lose in this case. Exactly. You took the words out of my mouth. Basically, their point was no matter who wins this case, it is going to be appealed. But what Jim Griffin and Dick Harputlian said was that they feel vindicated by today's decision in the sense that the court did find that Becky Hill was trying to influence the outcome of the trial. And perhaps they feel like carrying that nugget with them to whatever appellate process, whatever the next step is, that another court, another judge might rule differently based on which case law they choose. In this case, mm. the judge chose case law specifically uh, centered on the idea of prejudice being established, not just that Becky Hill reached out and tried to influence the election, but the jurors acted as a result of that. Maybe a different court sees it another way. Sam, you were in court. You were in the courtroom here today. One of the things that we've talked about a lot on this show is how this was described, Murdoch's initial trial, as the double murder trial of the century in South Carolina. It was so high profile. It captured the attention of the country. And now here you have some dramatic moments unfolding again in court today. Can you give us a sense of what it was like in the room, what you saw, what you heard, what the reaction was? It was packed, and I think you'd probably see somewhere in the neighborhood of 30, 40, 50 media outlets, wow. Hallie. So, of course, there was a big profile there, but you could audibly hear people gasp when that mm. first juror who came out right out of the gate and said, yes, I was influenced by Becky. No one was expecting that necessarily, clearly, based on the audience's reaction. Sam Brock, live for us there in Columbia. Sam, thank you so much for being with us. Let's take you overseas now because we're just getting some new details in on those U.S. service members killed in the Middle East. The first American military death since the Israel-Hamas war began. Sergeant William Rivers, Specialist Kennedy Sanders, Specialist Brianna Moffat. You see their names and faces there. They were killed in an armed drone attack at a military base in Jordan, according to the government. More than 30 other people were hurt, with new questions tonight about how this could have happened and how the U.S. will respond. And one big question here, might there have been a drone mix-up? According to our Pentagon team, that's one theory being put out there by officials, that perhaps this enemy drone was not shot down when it approached the base because it was mistaken for an American drone that was coming back in. Another theory, maybe this drone came in super low to the ground. We've learned this is the third drone attack on this base in just six months. The U.S. says the attacks bear the hallmarks of Iran-backed militants, but Iran denies any involvement. Here is what's clear. There is going to be a response, as President Biden put it. 
But the National Security Council spokesperson telling NBC News the administration is, in his words, working through options for what comes next. Watch. We'll do that on our schedule, in our time, and we'll do it in a manner of the president's choosing as commander in chief. So what would that even look like? How does this attack fit into the broader tit for tat between the U.S. and rebel groups we've been watching in the region? And then potentially complicating things even more, you've got the Houthis now claiming responsibility for new missile attacks against a U.S. ship in the Red Sea. So how does that fit in? All of it, of course, happening in the tinderbox of the Middle East, on edge, since that war in Gaza started nearly four months ago after that terror attack on Israel. It's where we find Raf Sanchez tonight. Ali Rafa is posted up outside the White House. But I want to start with Courtney Kuby, who is live for us at the Pentagon here. You've been reporting for the last, what, 48 hours on this court as we learned about this attack, as we learned about, obviously, the service members who were killed, their names, their pictures out tonight here. Talk us through what you're learning about what could come next, what a response might look like. What is the range of options the Pentagon's considering? So you will remember, Hallie, that there have been other attacks on um, uh, bases housing Americans in Iraq and Syria in recent weeks, more than 160 of them, actually, since October 17th. And some have caused American injuries, including some severe injuries, but one individual mm -hmm. in critical condition after one attack. And we have seen the U.S. response. Now, why we expect this to be different is because of the severity of the attack on Tower 22 on Sunday. So three Americans killed, at least 40 U.S. troops injured here. And these are a range of, of severity in their injuries from bumps and bruises, traumatic brain injury, up to three individuals who had to be um, medevaced all the way out to launch tool for further treatment. So uh, we expect this to be a larger response. But what's not clear is exactly what that will look like. I yeah. will say that the officials we're talking to here are saying every, just about everything is on the table, including the possibility of some more direct attacks on Iran. But it's important to point out here, a direct attack on Iran doesn't have to necessarily look what, what, what some people might think, like airstrikes into right. Tehran. There are cyber opportunities. There's other ways to go after Iran. What is very clear, according to the officials that we're speaking with here, is the president has been presented with options on Sunday and today. They are working through those options, and we do expect that there will be a response, and we expect it to be larger than what we've seen after the, uh, the previous attacks, Hallie. But so even hearing you talk about this, Courtney, right, I'm thinking about what we have talked about on this show over the course of the last almost four months now, and that has been this concern that there could be a wider regional conflict after the war obviously began after that Hamas terror attack in Israel and the war in Gaza here. Gut check, right? Is there any way that that regional, that wider regional conflict can be avoided at this point if there is some kind of a robust response now to this attack? So it's it's a very delicate game, right? So one of the yeah. things when they're presenting these options to the president, one of the things that they try to do is project an idea of the potential for casualties, whether it's civilians, whether it's militia members, but also can they some way in some way project or or predict how the proxy groups and Iran may respond to these? And that factors into the decision of what they're going to do here. I often talk about Hallie about the Goldilocks options. That seems to be a way that that military options are, tend to be um, presented. And I don't say in sure. that way to, to make light of it, but it's they, they, they present a, an option that is not particularly provocative or escalatory, one that's sort of in the middle, and then the one that might have the real potential for more prov provocation or escalation or, a, a, you know, the regional tensions really escalating into a conflict here. And then, frankly, it's up to the president to decide what to do. Yeah, that's right. It's ultimately the commander in chief's decision. Court, let me just ask you, I, mean, I know you got to run to do some more reporting here, but this issue of a p potential drone mix up, that perhaps the reason why this drone even got to where it did to create obviously such a, a tragic situation was because it was mistaken for maybe a U.S. drone coming back. What do we know? Yeah, and the real concern here is, is this a new tactic that militia groups mm. may be using to try to evade the base air defense systems? And I have to say, this is one of the theories by uh, the, the U.S. military is looking at for how the drone may have gotten through the air defense systems. And that is that the, the enemy attack drone came in around the same time as a U.S. drone that was coming in to land or hover near the area. And so the air defense systems may not have recognized it as a potential threat. But I will say they're also looking at the possibility that it came in at a very low altitude, and that may have factored into it. They're looking at those options, and it seems that they, they, are, they are really narrowing down on how those two factors may have really played in here, Hallie. Courtney Kuby, thank you so much. We're glad to have you there at the Pentagon uh, with all of this developing news for us. Thanks.
Ali, let me go to you here on the angle from the White House. We've obviously seen those photographs, that single photograph uh, handed up by the White House of President Biden meeting with his national security team. All of it contingent on what Courtney has just laid out here. The president, the commander in chief, is going to make a decision about what a U.S. response will look like. Do we know anything about timeline? What else are we hearing from folks inside the administration? Yeah, Hallie, the president, no doubt, very deep in a delicate and very complex decision-making process. Uh, with those top administration officials, we know he met with in the Situation Room earlier today as they weigh what the options are to be able to respond to Saturday night's attack, weigh really what the pros and cons of each option would be, and sort of figure out what the main objective is out of any sort of response. Would this be uh, simply for retaliatory reasons, or would it be more or perhaps also to serve as a deterrent, to deter any uh, of these perhaps same bad actors or other groups from taking advantage of this increased instability in the region and try to pull the U.S. deeper into this conflict. Now, White House officials aren't signaling what these options could be, but we did see Secretary of State Antony Blinken uh, set some expectations on what we're going to see next. He said earlier uh, that the U.S. response would be strong, it could be multi-leveled or phased, and it would be sustained over over time. And we can assume in this decision making that these officials are going back uh, to how this all started. Because remember, uh, everything the president has ordered and done since the war began on October 7th has been to prevent an attack like the one we saw on Saturday night from happening. He's ordered deterrence to this region in the form of more uh, U.S. troops, more carrier strike groups to prevent this from happening. Now that it has happened, you heard uh, Courtney talk about how that raises the Stakes. This is a, a historic attack, the first time U.S. service members have been killed in the Middle East by enemy forces since the war began. So that begs the question, how much stronger of a response could we see uh, compared to the responses we've seen uh, to these uh, Iran-backed uh, militias uh, striking these uh, U.S. carrier groups and U.S. commercial vessels in the Red Sea? Uh, many GOP lawmakers now pressuring the president to strike uh, Iran directly, but at this point, uh, the uh, National Security Council spokesman is not answering either way whether that could be an option that the president is considering, Hallie. Ali Rafa, thank you very much. We're going to get some other breaking news now out of the region because it is a busy night there. Both the Israelis and Hamas now throwing cold water on a potential hostage deal, or at least the framework of one. As our Andrea Mitchell reports, that framework would free some Israeli and American hostages in exchange for a 60-day pause in fighting after talks in Paris that included Israel. And in a conversation with the Qatari prime minister in just the last few hours, he sounded kind of optimistic about how talks are going. Listen. I will describe it, uh, the progress uh, that we are achieve, that we are making uh, in the last couple of weeks is, is we are in a much better place than where we were a uh, few weeks ago. But the Israeli prime minister's office tells our team they want to achieve complete victory. You see it there. And in the last hour, we've heard from Hamas as well, saying there's not going to be any exchange of prisoners until Israeli forces withdraw from Gaza. Raf Sanchez is live for us in Tel Aviv here. Kind of a disconnect, right, between the Qatari prime minister and what we have now heard late tonight from both Hamas and Israel. Talk us through where you see this going and, and if there is going to be anything that helps unlock the potential for a hostage deal. Hallie, I think the thing to remember here is this is a Middle Eastern negotiation, and at this very late hour, it's a little after 1 a.m. here in the Middle East, both sides are playing hardball. So the Israeli War Cabinet was meeting here in Tel Aviv earlier tonight, several-hour meeting. We still don't have a readout from it, but we understand that they were discussing this framework that was hammered out in Paris. Israeli, Qatari, Egyptian officials meeting with CIA Director Bill Burns you saw that statement from the prime minister's office reiterating their position that this war is going to continue until Israel achieves what it calls total victory. They have not formally said yet if the government is approving or rejecting this framework from Paris. But we do know Israeli negotiators said yes at the table there from Hamas's perspective. Again, the deal was only presented to them today. We got this statement. And again, they reiterated their position. They're not going to release any hostages until the war ends. Is there wriggle room here, Hallie, for both sides to find some place in the middle 
where they can meet, where there can be a pause in the fighting, mm. more humanitarian aid can get in, some of those hostages can come out. I think we're going to find out possibly in the next 24 hours. Alec. A critical 24 hours, of course, Raf. This is also coming on the heels separately of some allegations that Israel is making against the UN agency, UNRWA, that provides aid to Palestinians in Gaza here. What can you tell us about that? So we obtained a security dossier, an Israeli security dossier, earlier on today, and it outlines allegations against 12 Palestinian staff who work at UNRWA in Gaza. The dossier, we should say, Hallie, outlines the allegations. It does not contain the evidence against these 12 men. But these allegations being taken seriously enough by the United States, by other countries, that they have paused funding for UNRWA in the middle of this humanitarian crisis in Gaza. I'll give you one example of what this dossier says. It says a school counselor working at an UNRWA school crossed over into Israel on October 7th with his son, and he kidnapped a female hostage. So serious charges. You can see countries that have suspended aid as a result of these allegations. UNRWA says if that aid does not resume, then they are going to run out of money by the end of February. Take a listen to what one official had to say. What we have, the fund that we have, it will be enough for the end of February. But after that, we may suspend the whole operation of UNRWA. If there will be no renewing to the fund until the end of February, it is a catastrophe. And it's worth saying, Hallie, that UNRWA absolutely critical to getting humanitarian aid to literally hundreds of thousands of displaced Palestinians in Gaza right now. Hallie. Raf Sanchez live for us in a rainy Tel Aviv tonight. Raf, thank you. Tonight, some new developments in the escalating border beef between Texas and the Biden administration as we get ready to take it down south. Look at this. These are federal officers you're about to see getting ready to enter the river that separates Texas from Mexico. The boat's about to pull off into the water. Why are we showing this to you? It's the first time we've seen something like this in weeks because Texas state officials had been blocking the federal border patrol from accessing most of that huge park right along the border. That's where thousands of migrants try to cross into the U.S. The whole issue had to go to the Supreme Court just recently in this feud over razor wire, over access, et cetera. It comes as we're learning about a record-setting nearly 250,000 encounters with migrants at the southern border just in the month of December. As always, there is a nexus back home to politics here in Washington with some new information we're going to share with you in just a minute. But first, I want to get to Guad Venegas, who is live for us in Eagle Pass, Texas. Guad, um, talk about, and I see that you've shifted locations a little bit here. What are you seeing on the ground? And what is this sort of current moment here, the access that the Border Patrol is now able to get to the water? What does it mean for the bigger picture? Uh, Hallie, so this is a Shelby Park, which is all behind me. This is a city park okay. uh, that has been the center or the epicenter of this migrant cross uh, of the migrant crisis. Uh, this is where thousands of migrants arrived in December. Uh, the state came in with the National Guard and state troopers and took over. And then, of course, they didn't allow Border Patrol to come to the park uh, uh, for a few days now. Uh, but they did inform that uh, Border Patrol was able to use that boat ramp, uh, boat ramp. However, today's the first day when we were allowed to go to that boat ramp, and we did see Border Patrol uh, use the boat ramp to get two other boats uh, into the river. Now, before we had heard from DHS saying that at one point, Border Patrol needed to use that boat ramp, and they weren't allowed. So again, this is the first time we see them use that boat ramp. So uh, the dynamic the dynamic here has changed tremendously. We don't have that surge uh, that we did see in December. In the first two weeks of January, uh, we've already seen a 50 percent decrease of encounters at the southern border. And as this is happening here, the slowdown with the number of crossings and this standoff between state authorities and federal authorities when it comes to immigration, uh, we have uh, the deal being made in D.C., uh, Helly. And we're also now getting more details about what this immigration deal could contain, which is interesting because so the way it functions now at the border. A lot of the people that we've seen arrive, uh, Hallie, will cross the border and ask for humanitarian asylum, right? These are individuals that have that interview, and then they turn themselves in, and they're allowed to remain in the country under a parole. So uh, with the information we're now getting under the new immigration deal, uh, that would change the way that parole would be granted for them to stay in the United States, and it would give uh, federal authorities the ability to shut down the border in a way that they haven't been able to do so so far. 
um, it, that's critical, what you're talking about, the ability to be able to shut down the border, because that is part of what, as you lay out, is being talked about here, according to these sources, in that bill that's being discussed here in Washington. How much do you hear about that? How much do you hear about the federal machination squad when you're on the ground there in Texas? Because I will tell you, we know that voters, at least in the Republican primary, as I've been covering the last couple of weeks, care about border and immigration. That is consistently one of the top couple of uh, issues that um, that is reflected in our exit polling and our entrance polling. And it is obviously something that is taking up a lot of oxygen with these negotiations happening on the Hill. Quad. So, Hallie, uh, we have to understand the type of immigration policy that we have in the United States that applies to the border. So under the current policy, people can arrive in the United States and ask for this humanitarian parole, right? right. And we've seen these large numbers, thousands. Of, in average, it was 12,000 at some point. So the details we're getting now is that at some point, if this happens again, when it reaches four or 5,000 migrants per day, if, if they get to that average, then the Department of Homeland Security will be able to shut it down and turn migrants away. I, I'm just reading these details as we speak minutes ago. Some of these details indicating that at one point, migrants who choose to cross into the United States during a shutdown would be turned away back into Mexico. If anybody tries crossing twice, then they would receive a punishment where they wouldn't be allowed to apply for asylum. So a lot of these details are now being revealed of how things can change at the border if this border deal is approved. That would change the way the federal government and the Department of Homeland Security moves forward with these asylum seekers, Hallie. Guad Venegas live for us in Eagle Pass, covering all of it. Guad, we're glad to have you there. Thank you. We've got some more breaking news tonight. Federal prosecutors telling our team the FBI has arrested somebody who threatened to bomb a synagogue in Massachusetts, bringing up with the suspect apparently called genocide. The suspect is in court today on a single federal charge. After being arrested Thursday, he faces up to a decade in prison if convicted. Tom Winter is joining us now. So, Tom, the FBI says that this suspect invoked genocide in his threat, right? Why? That's exactly right, Hallie. And as a matter of fact, that court hearing has wrapped up, and that individual identified as John Reardon. He's 59 years old, from Massachusetts, will be detained, and he has been in police custody since last Thursday, as you mentioned, uh, pending a uh, detention hearing. Uh, they've charged him uh, with a single count. Basically, if you make a threat using the phone, that's in violation of federal law, specifically threatening to bomb a synagogue that's located in Attleboro, Massachusetts, about 40 miles south-southwest of Boston. Uh, he made specific threats and said that his uh, mood or his feeling about uh, Israel changed uh, following uh, their response to Hamas's terror attack, uh, threatened, as I said, to bomb uh, that synagogue. And uh, federal officials in Boston have taken these types of threats quite seriously, and they've talked about how they've been on the increase, Hallie. So uh, just another case and another threat against the Jewish community. Tom Winter, thank you very much. Coming up, a potential clue in one of the world's greatest mysteries. Why one explorer thinks he's found Amelia Earhart's lost plane. Plus, an investigation happening now in Kansas after a statue of Jackie Robinson was stolen from a park. We'll show you what the surveillance video describes. Shows, in just a second. So check this out. Look at all these farmers not in the fields, but in the streets outside Paris today. Not in cars, but obviously in tractors. Look at them, hundreds of them lining up on this big highway that leads into Paris, blocking traffic, at some points shutting down big stretches of this highway. It's only one part of a much bigger protest. Look at this. At one point, farmers piling up tires and burning them, also dumping a whole bunch of manure and dead animals in front of the gates of government offices. Why? Why are they doing this? All well, these farmers want to put pressure on the French government to give them things like better pay and better protection against cheap imports. They feel like the future of their industry is at stake. Josh Letterman is joining us now. Listen, Paris has seen a lot of protests this week. We all know the soup at the Mona Lisa incident from uh, environmental protesters over the weekend. This new French prime minister has also only been in the job for about a month. So what's the government saying about all this? Well, the government, first of all, Holly, is making clear that they have a red line, which is they are not going to tolerate these uh, French protesters shutting down airports, shutting down the largest agricultural market in Paris, which feeds about 8 million people. But they are trying to take some steps to appease these farmers. They announced measures including uh, freezing a tax on the diesel that they use for tractors, which was really very loathed by those farmers. They're making some changes uh, to cut red tape on environmental regulations. But the farmers 
are saying, look, this is small potatoes. This is not enough to actually address the structural problems here, which is that uh, they feel that they are not able to sell their products for enough. They feel like there are goods flowing in from elsewhere in Europe at lower prices and lower quality that's driving down their prices. And they say, frankly, this is not going to be a sustainable uh, field of work for the next generation unless something changes ASAP. Connect the dots for us of how this plays into the bigger food crisis around the world that we're seeing that's only been made worse by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Because as you talk about sort of the agricultural issues in France, that's part of the driver. Yeah, there's sort of two elements to this. I just spoke with a French family farmer from the Normandy region who said, look, before the war, we used to sell a whole lot of wine to Russia. Since uh, the war started, they're not allowed to sell products to Russia anymore. There's that embargo. And as a result, they've lost a large part of their market. But they also say that when the war started uh, and the Russians, of course, blockaded the Black Sea, wouldn't let the Ukrainians export their products uh, by sea, the EU tried to help Ukraine out by saying, OK, look, we're going to remove move a lot of the barriers to importing food from Ukraine into the EU so at least you can sell your product and hold your economy together. The French farmers say that a flow of Ukrainian uh, hay, uh, grain and hay and other products is coming in at lower prices than what the French sell their own products for is driving the market uh, to a low and making it impossible for French farmers to compete. So even though they have sympathy for the Ukrainians, they say their own farmers and their own families are suffering as a result of what the EU has tried to do to help Ukraine over the, these last couple of years, Sally. Josh Letterman, live for us there overseas. Thank you. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, police in Philly capturing that teenage murder suspect after he spent five days on the run. They found him getting on a bus in the city. Remember, this teenager was being transported to the hospital for a hand injury when he escaped last week. He's waiting to go on trial for a 2020 murder charge. Number two, in L.A. now, police looking for a group of alleged dog nappers after they drove off with this Frenchie cell phone video. Look at this. Shows its owner clinging to the car. She, look, I mean, she jumps straight up on the hood of that car. It starts to drive off. She's still gripping it. She eventually gets tossed off. She was okay, but Onyx, her puppy, was not. Still hasn't been found. Police say this is just one of a number of high-profile crimes targeting French bulldogs in this area. Number three, Amazon today calling off its deal to buy iRobot with both companies blaming regulatory hurdles from the EU. Remember, iRobot makes Roomba. They announced the CEO will step down, that the company is now going to have to lay off about a third of its staff. Amazon will pay iRobot a termination fee of more than $90 million. Number four, officials in Kansas are looking for whoever stole a statue of Jackie Robinson from a park. They literally just left behind the shoes. They cut this statue off right at the ankles. Security video shows two people hauling the statue into a truck. No idea who they are, officials say, or, or what the motivation was here. Number five, a dying thief who stole a pair of those iconic Wizard of Oz ruby slippers, getting no prison time at a sentencing hearing today. The 76-year-old man stole those shoes from the Judy Garland Museum in 2005. He apparently wanted to pull off one last score, thought they were real rubies. Those are not real rubies, that's just glass. The man is in hospice care and is expected to die in the next few months. When we come back, a crime unresolved for decades heading to trial today. What we're learning about the two men accused of killing Run DMC's Jam Master J. Plus, why Europe's biggest airline says it's gonna buy a bunch of Boeing planes dropped by American counterparts. Federal prosecutors today telling a New York jury that Run DMC's Jam Master J was killed in what they call an ambush and an execution motivated by greed and revenge. Carried out, they say, by his godson and a childhood friend. Jay's real name was Jason Mazel. He was one of the founding members of Run DMC, just 37 years old when he was killed 20 years ago, his death sending shockwaves through the rap world. Run DMC was the first rap group, remember, to feature prominently on MTV. They really helped bring hip hop to the mainstream back in the mid 80s. They sold millions of records, just huge. The two defendants were charged in 2020. Federal prosecutors say they killed Mazel after he cut one of the men out of a drug deal. They pleaded not guilty. Angela Senadella is joining us now. And Angela, Run DMC um, took an anti-drug stance in lyrics, PSAs, but prosecutors say Mazel was killed over a drug deal. 
What did we learn today in court? How could this trial affect the legacy of Run DMC? Give us some of the, the facts of the case here. So we learned that prosecutors claim that Mazelle fell on some financially challenging times and as a result acquired 10 kilos of cocaine to distribute and that he intended to distribute those alongside the defendants. But that now the motive that's been ascribed by the prosecutors for this murder is that he allegedly then cut those two men out of this $200,000 cocaine deal. Now we also learned that Mazelle was in his Queens recording studio at the time surrounded by a number of people when Washington and Jordan allegedly came in and asked as Mizell stood up to greet his own godson, Mizell, uh, Mizell, as Mizell stood up to greet his own godson, that Jordan allegedly shot him from just a few inches away. Now, and then they ran away and were not charged until 2020. So we do have a quote here from the prosecutor, the assistant U.S. attorney, that let's pull up now, Miranda Gonzalez, who said each defendant was proud that they had taken down Jam Master Jay and got away with it. Now, look, that was just the prosecution. We also had the defense trying to seed doubt here. We had a lawyer for Washington, who was Mizell's childhood friend, claim that Washington was an alcoholic and was being housed by Mizell at the time. So Ezra Spike here asks, why bite the hand that feeds you? Why kill the person you depend on? I also want to note, Hallie, that the other defendant, Jordan, had a lawyer who claimed that Jordan, the, his own godson, had an alibi at the time and was with his pregnant ex-girlfriend. Why did it take so long to charge these men with the murder? And what about a third person who was charged last year? Yeah, these prosecutors claim that they almost had no information, even after offering up to $60,000 in rewards for tips until the last five years. And it seems to be because the people who were there at the time are now coming forward, likely due to other incentives, like, for example, criminals who have offered information for reduced sentences. They also claim that there's been advanced ballistic testing that can now link directly to Jordan's gun. Now, this third defense Jay Bryan was just brought in recently and will have a new trial in the next year. So not this year at all. It's separate. And the claim is that he was involved. They've seen him opening the door to the building, but we don't know yet the extent of his involvement. Angela Senadella, thank you very much. One we will be watching for sure. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. And because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our international teams have done it for you. Here is some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of the UK, King Charles and Princess Kate are both out of a private London clinic today. We only saw the king leave. There he is. He was getting a procedure for an enlarged prostate. The Princess of Wales, remember, had been hospitalized for nearly two weeks after abdominal surgery. We don't know why. They're expected, both of them, to take some time to recover before returning to public life. In Ireland, Europe's biggest airline, Ryanair, says it's willing to buy Boeing 737 MAX 10 planes that U.S. airlines don't want anymore for the right price. This is after United Airlines says it doesn't think Boeing will deliver hundreds of MAX 10s it ordered back in 2017. Those are already, like, four years late. Boeing, of course, has faced so much scrutiny lately over issues with its MAX 9 model. It had been dealing with delivery delays for the MAX 10 even before that. And out of the Pacific, a potential clue, maybe, in Amelia Earhart's disappearance, a U.S. explorer says he thinks he found the wreckage of her plane using deep-sea sonar technology. He's shown off these images, so that's, if you saw him, kind of a blurry something, something blurry deep in the water. It's about halfway between Australia and Hawaii. Earhart and her navigator went missing in 1937 while she was trying to become the first woman to circumnavigate the world in a plane. So tonight, as the Republican presidential field looks ahead to the next votes in Nevada and South Carolina, we are looking at how former President Donald Trump got those big double-digit wins in the first two states, Iowa and New Hampshire, how he pulled that support together. Our NBC News campaign reporter Alex Tabbitt has talked with hundreds of voters in both states over the last many months from rallies to town halls and, yes, local diners. And tonight, he's got our backstory, that behind-the-scenes look at how a story comes together, our version of the reporter's notebook, or in this case, the Embed's journal. He changes everything. He needs to get back in. He gets stuff done. He's about America. He puts America first. He gets the job done. we got to be united, and that's what Trump wants. He wants a united America. Hundreds of conversations with Trump supporters across Iowa and New Hampshire over seven months. And what have I learned? The people who love him really love him. Donald Trump is great. He, he picks on a lot of people. He, get over it. And through all those interviews, I kept hearing a lot of the same things over and over. Trump fans are laser focused on the economy, immigration policy, and feel an overwhelming sense of injustice. 
like Nicholas Dagnall, an 18 year old high school senior from Franklin, New Hampshire. He's a businessman, and at the end of the day, America is a business and should be run like a business. Despite low unemployment, below 4% for almost two years, Americans are still feeling the impact of inflation. I first met Virgil Thornston, a Navy veteran at a barber shop in Wacon, Iowa in August of 2023. The 3.7% inflation rate at the time, way down from its peak, he said wasn't being reflected in his day-to-day -day experience. Things still cost a lot more. Well, one thing is I was just over and had a meatball dinner and it cost me 16 bucks. And even five months later, on the night of the Iowa caucuses, brothers Mike and Joe Stein, student athletes at the University of Iowa, agreed that higher prices were a big part of Trump's win. I think people people know that they had a better lifestyle with inflation and uh, grocery money and the results things, gas money. Themselves. The results speak for themselves. And then there's the border. <laughs> Trump's signature issue starting all the way back in 2015 still resonating. From the Lothenburg brothers in Dubuque, Iowa in September. Our border is just too easy to get into. To Keith Christine, who I met waiting in line for a Trump rally during a thunderstorm in July. The border and everything, all the crises have just doubled and everything was better under the Trump administration. New Hampshire and Iowa, both a long way from the southern border and the cities where migrants are getting bust. But it doesn't mean that the record number of people arriving aren't on voters' minds. The invasion at our border has brought a number of, of enemies of America in, and our infrastructure is not well guarded. And finally, I kept hearing over and over that Trump is the victim. I feel like he's fighting for his right. 91 felony counts, but Colleen Decker, a pastor's wife in Ottumwa, Iowa, says they've only helped the former president. I definitely think it has um, promoted him. Trump's polling has only gotten stronger in the face of his indictments. Bring on some more charges. The guy died of ham sandwich. When I asked Asked Trump supporters at the Iowa State Fair back in August why Trump had been indicted for the fourth time in Georgia for his alleged efforts to illegally overturn the election. Voters like Jeff Lendrick, a school custodian, said they didn't know why and they didn't care. Do you care that he's been indicted four times? No, that just makes me want to vote for him more. Because whoever the Democrats hate is who I like. Trump's legal troubles aren't the only so-called injustice I kept hearing about. Many of them believe Trump's baseless assertion that the last election was stolen from him. I think they cheated before, and I think they're going to try to do it again because they're a bunch of communists that don't care. George Crosby, a retired truck driver and veteran from Fitzwilliam, New Hampshire, is just one of the many people who repeated Trump's unfounded claim that he actually won re-election in 2020. President Trump, he is still president in my mind. A man whose personality has seemingly overshadowed the rest of the Republican field. A man who loves this country like I love my country. And whose supporters are completely enamored. When you see him hugging a flag and kissing it, it's real. It's true. Alex is joining us now. So, Alex, we know that many of the former president's supporters inside the Republican Party, as you point out, very loyal to him. The question is, what happens to former President Trump if he does make it into a general election against President Biden? Of course, that's where some of these question marks are. One of the things that I found uh, in my time in the field, and it was great to see you the last couple of weeks in Iowa, New Hampshire, is that when you talk to supporters of these candidates, any of the candidates, they want to tell you why they're backing who they back. Did you find that to be your experience as you were living in Iowa, as you're getting ready to move to Arizona to cover that state? Not necessarily is that always the case for me, Hallie. F uh, former President Donald Trump's rhetoric against the media industry, against journalism, has taken a bit of a toll in terms of when I'm trying to interview voters. But when there is that hesitancy, at least my approach is I take the camera, I put it off on the side. I talk to these voters and I, I tell them, I work for NBC News, but I tell them a bit about who I am as a person. And I learn a little bit about who they are. Because I'm not going to be able to dispel anyone's preconceived notion about the media industry in a couple of minutes, but I can build a little bit of trust. And if they do do the interview, and it doesn't always work out, but when they do take the interview, I, I find it makes a more authentic interview, a more authentic experience. On the back end, I'll take down their phone number, I'll give them a call, I'll shoot them a text, and show them that their interview was properly reflected and their opinion was properly displayed. Hallie? Alex Tabbitt, uh, thank you very much for bringing us uh, a look there at what is driving some of the support for former President Trump. It's part of a story, as we'll be doing in the backstory, our reporter's notebook throughout the next few weeks leading up to South Carolina. Thanks. Still to come, the new lawsuit against Duncan, why the company is being accused of discriminating against some of its customers.
tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight, it's some potential legal trouble brewing for Duncan in a new lawsuit that asks an interesting question. Is charging for non-dairy milk discrimination against people who have problems drinking regular milk? The customers behind this new suit say yes, because they say being lactose intolerant or allergic to dairy milk, that's a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Here's our Vicky Wynn. Laura Primo is originally from New England, so naturally she was a Dunkin' regular. But recently... I can't touch any dairy with a 10-foot pole. She loves her coffee with coconut milk now, but when she realized Dunkin' was charging extra for it, she felt milked for money. It just kind of upset me. You know, my favorite coffee is, is messing with me. That's why she and nine other Dunkin' customers filed a class action lawsuit against the company last month, asking for at least $5 million in damages. The suit comes after a slew of other food class actions. Those focused on misleading advertising against companies like her she and Kraft. Some have called those lawsuits frivolous and they've seen limited success in court. But this suit says Duncan is discriminating against people with lactose intolerance or milk allergies, alleging violations of the Americans with Disabilities Act. They're making a significant profit off of these customers, their customers, uh, because of uh, their disabilities. Because of the law, public entities have to make reasonable modifications for people with disabilities. At first glance, lactose intolerance or milk allergies may not seem like a disability, but in 2008, Congress broadened the law, which one expert thinks now covers those types of conditions. People who have chronic conditions, lactose intolerance or food allergies, if they are substantially limiting their ability to eat and to function day to day, and they're considered disabilities under the act. Companies do have a way out if they can prove making those changes would fundamentally alter the nature of their business or impose an undue burden. Duncan acknowledged the suit and has until March to respond. It did not reply to our request for comment. They offer sweeteners that aren't sugar. They offer decaffeinated coffee, not only caffeine coffee. To single out the non dear alternative, is discriminatory. The same law firm behind the Duncan lawsuit also filed a separate but similar class action suit against Starbucks in 2022. Starbucks filed a motion to dismiss that is still pending. Starbucks arguing that the lawsuit moving forward would have far reaching consequences and would force retailers to choose between no longer offering more expensive items, losing substantial revenue or raising prices across the board. Vicky is joining us now. It's super interesting to hear about all these pieces of it, Vicky. And you mentioned there's been a whole bunch of food-related lawsuits that have happened recently that have had limited success. Obviously, this is different, but help us understand the bigger picture here of customers, of consumers sort of standing up and trying to come after some companies for the way that they sell their products. Here, listen, Hallie, let's refresh your viewers' memories about a couple of the lawsuits. A woman in Florida sued Kraft, the maker of the Kraft macaroni and cheese, saying that it was misleading advertising, that it takes a lot longer than the three and a half minutes that's labeled on the cup to make that instant mac and cheese, that you they didn't account for the time to take the lid off or to pour the water in or to stir in the cheese sauce. That lawsuit tossed. The Hershey's lawsuit. Do you remember this one? It was filed at the end mm -hmm. of last year. A woman said, you know those little jack-o'-lanterns and the footballs and the bats? Well, on the picture, they're advertised as having cute little faces, but you open that thing, the football, the football looks like an egg. There is no jack-o'-lantern face. <laughs> that is still making its way through the courts. This lawsuit is different. We're talking about the Americans with Disabilities Act, That's which right was put into place to be enforced via a lawsuit. There is no mechanism to enforce the ADA other than people suing. And so the hope here is that by saying that folks who have lactose intolerance, a real medical condition, right? If you can change the laws for these folks under the ADA, then hopefully it has broader implications for everyone. So these lawsuits are a little bit different than the others we've seen. Important point. Uh, Vicki, thank you very much. Keep following this one for us. We'll be interested to see how it turns out. Thanks. Still to come here on the show, why a Russian skating star's suspension could mean America gets gold instead of silver for an Olympics that happened years ago. Plus, some new questions about any real change around doping and ice skating. That's coming up. All right, so can the U.S. get a silver medal upgraded to gold two years after the last Winter Olympics? 
Top officials here say, yeah, they should. After a Russian teenage ice skating superstar got hit with a four-year suspension. Do you remember this? This was the scandal of the Beijing Games. Kamila Valieva, who was then just 15 years old. Again, total superstar, world record holder. And apparently, somebody let down by the adults around her, with the world learning just hours before she took the ice that she had failed a drug test. This suspension now, four years, again, it's going to wipe out her performance in those games, although she is going to be allowed to compete in Italy in 2026, the next Winter Olympics. The U.S. anti-doping agency blames Russia, saying that this is yet another example of Moscow robbing clean athletes. Megan Fitzgerald has it all covered for us from London. Listen, nothing's going to get that moment back, right, where the U.S. figure skating team could have won it all but instead got second. Is there a possibility that the U.S. could actually end up with the gold here? When could that happen? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Team USA will never get that moment back. I mean, there wasn't even a, a medal ceremony, if you remember. Uh, this entire thing is unprecedented. We've never not seen a medal ceremony at the Olympic Games. But to your question, could Team USA get the gold? That is a question we will likely learn the answer to in March when the International Olympic Committee, and I'll pause for a second, is a ambulance going by, but when the International Olympic Committee meets in March, that's when we could learn whether or not Team USA is going to get the gold. But then you've got Japan that finished third. You've got Canada that finished fourth. So will Canada medal? Again, answers that could come in the next couple of weeks. But you also have to remember there's the possibility that that gold medal position could just remain vacant. That is something that we typically see when athletes uh, test positive for banned substances, Hallie. As we're watching Valieva here, I mean, she was, again, just a total prodigy at the last Olympics. She's going to compete in the next one, but there were so many questions when this happened, and we covered it, I think, on the show, about the adults around her. It's not like Russia's state-sponsored drug program has been a secret. There was, like, an Oscar-winning documentary about it. But Valieva's coach, her doctor, so far they have not faced any repercussions, and the U.S. anti-doping agency is also blaming the world agency that's supposed to stop cheating. They want a full review to stop this from ever happening again, Megan. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is not Russia's first rodeo, as you mentioned. We see this time and time and time again, and people are wondering uh, when will there be consequences so severe that this pattern stops. I mean, you look at 2018, for example, and we saw Russian athletes competing in the Olympics, albeit underneath the Olympic flag. Um, but that's on the heels of, of when the world found out about the 2014 doping scandal. Then fast forward to uh, the Olympics this year in um, Paris in 2024. And we are again going to see Russian athletes competing. Now, they will be competing under a, a different name. They'll be competing under individual neutral athletes. That, of course, is because the IOC made that determination after Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, but again, we will be seeing Russians competing in the Olympics fresh off of another scandal uh, that we just saw two years ago, Howie. Megan Fitzgerald live for us there overseas just a few months now ahead of Paris kicking off for, of course, the Summer Olympics. Megan, thank you so much. That does it for us for this hour. We've got a lot more coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.